Welcome to the Keto Geek Podcast. Let's do this. Health, nutrition, fitness, low carb lifestyle. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our Keto Geek Podcast. Today we have Dr. Peeler Ballerstedt at our, uh, well, he's not at our studio, but he is on Skype with me and. He is an awesome person who will be talking about the sustainability aspect of ruminant agriculture. Just to give you guys a little bit of background on who he is, he is and he has extensive experience in forage agriculture. He was the forage extension specialist at Oregon University from 1986 till 1992. He is also the forage product manager at manager at Barenbrook USA, but he is not affiliated with them, especially when it comes to the conversation here. And he's also not a big fan of the low fat is healthy heart, blah, 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 dietary advice that we've been given for the last 50 years. So doctor, do you have anything else to add over here that I might have missed out? Or do you want to explain your journey forward? Sure, I'd be happy to. And thank you for this opportunity. Uh, Just a few minor points. Um, The land-grant university in Oregon is Oregon State. They're the beavers. The university down the road, that's uh, University of Oregon. They're their ducks, and we don't really care. Um, It's in-state rivalry stuff, so I was (laughs) at Oregon State. Um, And, yeah, I am not going to be speaking today as a representative of the company that employs me, but People should know that I work in agriculture. Um, People should know that I'm an advocate for low-carb, healthy fat, as well as for ruminant animal agriculture. And I try to introduce both audiences to each other because I think we really have a lot to learn from each other and with each other. Um, I've worked in forage agriculture now for most of my adult life. Um, and I do currently work for a forage seed company. So the seeds that a farmer would plant for pasture or for hay or for silage, um, are the, the products that, that I work with. Awesome. So question, how did you get into the low carb, high fat? What was the epiphany over here? What happened? Sure. Well, uh, one, I got older. So in... 2007, I guess it was, I finally got serious about what I came to understand was um, a a trend towards developing prediabetes, uh, depending on how rigorous you want to be with the various risk factors. Nobody at that point was talking about measuring insulin. Um, It was, or at least that I was aware of. So we were still dealing with things like uh, abdominal obesity, um, depressed HDL cholesterol, elevated fasting blood glucose, elevated uh, blood pressure, um, and I'm going to forget the fifth one. Um, oh, elevated triglycerides. And again, based on some authority's decision, if you have three out of five of those conditions, then you qualify as having prediabetes. So I realized that that's where I was headed, if not already there. Um, My wife, Nancy, had already been five years onto a journey of reading and implementing uh, a restricted carbohydrate diet. And as anyone who's gone down this path knows, you, you, you start somewhere and you learn and change as you go along. So we're very much not where we were back then. Uh, But all of that led to personal experience and personal discoveries. And in reading books like Good Calories, Bad Calories, um, and indeed later Why We Get Fat, and most recently The Case Against Sugar, uh, uh, The Big Fat Surprise by Nina Teicholz, other books, uh, um, the Protein Power series by Michael and Mary Dan Eads, all of those books sort of reawakened in me uh, my 
keen interest in grazing management, in ruminant animal agriculture, in forage agriculture, and that actually got me back into agriculture. I had been working in high tech from 95, and then um, in 2011, I got to come back to agriculture. So my my journey now is very much wrapped up with all of those uh, topics. Awesome. So one of the terms that you use is forage agronomy or agronomist. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, what does it entail to be a forage agronomist? Yeah, uh, remind me to tell you a story about the, the, the conference up in Seattle. But an agronomist is someone who's trained in the sciences, you know, soil sciences, plant sciences, um, the, the production of crops, um, which would be different than horticulture, right? A little different, although I have some training in that area as well. Um, strictly speaking, I think it's, you could think of it as soil and, plant and, and, and field sciences. Um, and that's the one side. And on the other side, I, I came to focus just on forages. So forages are those plants that are meant to be consumed by livestock. So if you think of alfalfa, that's a forage. If you think of pasture, that falls under forage. If you think about silages, those fall under forages. And then I received a good deal of training in uh, ruminant nutrition. And so ruminants are those animals uh, that have the specialized stomachs, the four compartmented stomachs. They chew a cud. They, because of the bacteria and other microorganisms that live in the reticular rumen are able to break down the fiber in their diet. And then they chew cud, and I guess even toes is another characteristic of a ruminant. So if you think of cows, you think of sheep, you think of goats, those are the predominant ones, but there's also buffalo, there's also um, antelope, and uh, a, a large number of other ruminants. Awesome. So one thing that I get asked all told all the time is meat causes colorectal cancer. I hear that everywhere. So a lot of us know in, in this uh, low carb world, we, we we're pretty much good skeptics of all of these claims. But what about the rest of the people? How can they kind of understand What's going on in these uh, in this situation? Where can they find resources? How can they become good s skeptics here? What kind of resources do we have? Well, I, I guess there's a couple ways to attack it. One would be to introduce people to the far greater uh, association between diabetes and cancer. Um, and as we've all gone down this path, we've been introduced to just how much all of this depends on nutritional epidemiological studies. And as we learn more about that, the more we learn that they're just really so soft as far as information and, and, and scientific rigor. Um, we could introduce them to uh, the the information that shows how we had populations who were not yet exposed to refined carbohydrate were eating their traditional diets, whatever those traditional diets were, and they didn't have these diseases that we've come to refer to as you know Western diseases or whatever the other phrase is. And yet, when those same populations began to eat refined flour and refined sugar, all of those diseases started showing up within a generation. So there, there's, it's, it's a 
complicated story. Um, the, the simplest way to attack it, perhaps, is to simply say that the only information that makes that kind of a claim is from these kinds of nutritional uh, surveys, epidemiological surveys. We, we don't have plausible um, explanation from biochemistry or from physiology or from endocrinology. Okay. And we've m beaten this topic to the death that epidemiological studies are not the best studies to rely on as well. So what happened? What's the, what's the history behind it? How did we end up over here with all of this crisis in the agricultural, with all these process companies, and then this drive towards environmentalism? So could we get an idea? Well, sure. Um, so it, it's interesting. Um, the, the transition Certainly, World War I was a major inflection point. You know, lots of young men left the farm and then came back, and they didn't necessarily want to go back to the farm, or in some cases, they couldn't for some reasons we could talk about. A huge one was going to be World War II and then coming back. And so if you look at ag research, what you see is a lot of the people that did a lot of really good research grew up on the farm, went and served in the military, came back from that experience. They went to college or they finished college in some cases and went to graduate school uh, via GI Bill and some other support. They didn't necessarily want to go back to the farm, but they wanted to stay in agriculture. And and one of the things that was happening in agriculture in the United States post-World War II is in order to deal with the increasing cost of labor, a lot of the changes that are now familiar had to take place. Because people could you know, work in the city or work somewhere else and make more than they could at the farm. So th there's been these big societal changes and one can say what's a lead and what's a follower but they're reflected in agriculture so today for example in the United States we have more people in the United States today that are actually incarcerated than are listed as primary operators of farms And, and the problem with that is that all it takes to be called an operator of a farm is you have to, you know, I don't know, sell a thousand dollars worth of product off of your, quote, farm, unquote. So if you dig into those numbers a little bit further, what you find is that um, more than 70 percent of that two million people, just a little bit more, that are primary operators. So you know, let's let's call it somewhere around three quarters just to keep the math easy for me. Only only 500,000 people who are listed as primary operators of farms in the United States are making more than 25 percent of their household income from their farm. Wow. <laughs> uh, so so and and upon them all the rest of our society depends. So it's, it's, it's really easy to kind of sit back and, you know, judge things, but let's pause for a moment and, and realize because they're doing that, we don't have to. And that allows us to do other things like we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the, so with that as sort of prelude, let me step back and say that, we're familiar with the development of the dietary guidelines, the dietary goals first and then the dietary guidelines. What we may not be as familiar with is the sort of social time in which those came from. So in the 60s and 70s, we had various movements and various beliefs and, and uh, worldviews. And 
the dietary goals and dietary guidelines are very much a product of those times. Um, and basically, <laughs> this, this belief system about the healthfulness and the planet-friendliness of a plant-based diet springs from that time as well as some predecessors. But that found its way into the dietary guidelines, and they're still trying to promote that. And so in January, I think, of 2015, well, actually, December of 2014, the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, which is this expert panel that's assembled every five years to consider the best evidence and then make their recommendations that then goes to the USDA and the HHS to form the next edition of the Dietary Guidelines. They drop this bomb on everyone just shortly before Christmas and New Year's saying that they were now prepared to exclude even lean meat from a healthy diet pattern. And the reason that they were going to use to justify that was sustainability. I see. Um, yeah, so that, that caused a minor kerfluffle, uh, kerfluffle and... Um, so that's still there. It, it's still operating, this, this idea that somehow a plant-based diet is healthier than one based on meat or even an omnivorous diet. So uh, all of that is, is still there. And part of what I want us all to c consider is uh, I'm, I'm leveraging um, Gary Taubes' article from New York Times Magazine. And basic, what if it's all been a big fat lie? Of course, when he wrote that article, it was, what if fat doesn't make you fat? But what if all of this has, to one degree or another, been part of this same narrative and, and mistaken belief system? And that then should inform our conversation about sustainability. Um, it should inform our discussion about food quality and all of those things as well. So if somebody says processed food, for example, are you really saying that you consider tofu and cornflakes to be the equivalent of beef jerky and all beef hot dogs and, you know, whatever, salami and, you know, bacon? But, are those all thought to be equivalent because they're processed? And, and I would push back really hard uh, and suggest, no, in fact, that processed animal products are completely different from processed animal products, uh, processed plant products. Mm. So was there a specific turning point or, or what was it all just Ansel Keys? Is, is, is he the one to blame over here again, or what was the yeah. flip here? Well, I, I think Ansel Keys is one of the cast of players, but you could go all the way back to uh, John Harvey Kellogg, for example, who in the, I think he's in the 1880s kind of time frame, is um, promoting a bland plant-based diet, partly out of his belief system, partly out of his uh, ego, um, to deal with moral ills in the society. Um, and from him, we have the breakfast cereal industry. Now, he wasn't a big fan of sugar, but in time, uh, Kellogg's obviously went with sugar. And, and then, as Gary Taubes lines out very well in uh, the case against sugar, we got to a point where breakfast cereals may have been close to 50% by weight sugar, but it was still, you know, part of a healthy diet. Um, so you, you had that peculiar strain of American vegetarianism moving forward. You had the environmentalism of the day. 
you, you, you had uh, people saying that, you know, we can't support humanity um, by eating meat. We have to go to plant-based diets. And, and so all of that, if there, there's lots and lots of people playing a role in here. Uh, Keyes' point, obviously, was uh, promoting this idea that saturated, ultimately, he landed on saturated fat in the diet, raising cholesterol, leading to heart disease. And that got tied up with the idea that, well, you couldn't get fat if you didn't eat fat. You are what you eat, after all, um, which itself is a myth. But um, So... You, you, you had that, you had people trying to push back against this idea, um, but they weren't as well placed or as vigorous or as forceful as others. You certainly had industry funding one side versus another, and that was one of the big ahas for me reading the case against sugar was the role of the sugar industry in, in, in funding the work of people who were saying it's fat in the diet that's causing heart disease. Against and, and because there were people saying, no, it's the sugar in the diet, or there were people saying, well, we really don't know what in the diet is causing heart disease. We have some ideas. We need to do some more research. Some of these people were essentially marginalized because they were portrayed as being, you know, in the pocket of the animal agriculture. There's a long story behind all that. Um, but some really good scientists were essentially uh, ridiculed for trying to say, you know, we really don't have data to say that a Major, you know, 60% diet, 60% um, of the diet coming from carbohydrates is healthy. Um, we have some evidence, in fact, that it might be unhealthy. And they were, you know, poo pooed by uh, the people who were pushing the other narrative. Um, I'm looking right now because it's, it's really quite remarkable. The things that weren't known at the time that the dietary goals were first released. And I'll see if I can't come to some of those questions. Um, but essentially, they were forced to include these questions as areas that need additional research when the, the second edition of the dietary goals was um, Released, and um, I apologize for this taking me this long to find. Uh, I'm doing a bit of slide reorganization, and it sounded like a good idea <laughs> <laughs> um, at the time, but that means I can't find some of the things that used to be very accessible. Um, so, so, and and at the same time, you then had other industries that grew up to, you know, the. The, the obvious one was the uh, snack well cookie, right? You know, let's, or, or low fat yogurt was the other example. If, if it, you know, if fat is bad, we'll find a product. Now we'll create a, a niche and we can market this and, and make money. And there's all kinds of label claims that are now, you know, doing that. I, I found the slide. This report also cannot begin to discuss the many unanswered research questions. Now, remember, this is 1997. Okay. Nevertheless, some of the important questions which are currently being investigated include, does lowering the plasma cholesterol level through dietary modification prevent or delay heart disease in man? In other words, we don't have the answer yet, but we're going to tell you to. What is, the, wow. what is the exact relationship between dietary cholesterol and plasma cholesterol? Right? They're going to tell us not to eat cholesterol because we need to be worried about the cholesterol in our blood, but they're admitting that they don't know the exact relationship. That's a bit of a fudge because there was work going back to the 30s 
that showed essentially no relationship. But okay, minor point. Um, does consumption of a low fat parentheses under twenty percent close parentheses low animal protein and high complex carbohydrate diet reduce the risks associated with the intake of dietary cholesterol at current American levels? In other words. Will our diet work? We don't know. Number four, is hydrogenation of vegetable oils a factor in the development of heart disease? People were trying to warn them, but the people who were warning them were behaving like scientists. The people who were promoting this idea were acting as advocates. So they were forced to admit that they didn't know if, in fact, what they were promoting might cause harm. So they listed as a reason. Getting the picture here? How, in the last one, how do the various lipoproteins interact? And why does HDL apparently protect against heart disease? Okay? This is the degree of, of how bad this was. And so if you're looking for players, you can find them throughout. Part of what I think we need to be doing now is how, how can we become better communicators? How can we, through across this space, and that gets back to my idea of I, I, I want the producers – and the uh, you know low carb healthy fat community whatever that is to get introduced to each other because the the aspects of health cut across that chasm everybody eats right um and and if we can get past some of this stuff that's accumulated and drill down to some of the important information about, you know, important biomarkers or meaningful risk or effective dietary interventions. That's stuff that we can all take and apply. Yeah. Wow. So we didn't do a great job in the past. Uh, well, no, indeed. Uh, here's a, here's a, a, a quote from uh, Dr. Eads, Michael Eads. Um, We've all been unwitting subjects in a long observational study, the hypothesis of which is that a low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet will reduce obesity, diabetes, and the other so-called diseases of civilization. In my view, it hasn't worked out all that well, <laughs> which is just a marvelous understatement. And then there's a there's another quote from Gary Taubes. Can we get the low fat proponents to apologize? Yeah, I, I, I saw that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think so, but it would be nice. Um, and and we we now uh, there's this. It, it's interesting to watch now as things change, right? But basically, official policy is going to take a long time to change. Unfortunately, a lot of programs are being aligned with that policy. So that's a whole nother conversation. But it, it could take a whole, you know, another 30 years to get this super tanker, if you will, turned around and, and heading in what, you know, perhaps you and I would argue appears to be a more informed direction. Well, there's a lot of people here that that are being impacted and how do we if you will foster this grassroots um movement yeah that's uh that's a that's a tough question right there especially with our information age and everybody having such a low attention span everything being quick to acquire instant gratification this culture does not seem to foster at least in United States, it does not seem to foster this sort of uh, grassroot level social uh, sort of uh, environment. So <laughs> it's going to be well, a challenge. Yeah, it'll be a challenge um, for sure. I have some ideas. I have some approaches. But uh, part of it is is we've got to get 
Yeah, what is it? Um, yeah, they used to say that if uh, if you give a million monkeys typewriters, they'd reproduce reproduce Shakespeare. But now, thanks to the internet, we know that's not true. <laughs> Ouch. Which, yeah, ouch, just a little bit, right? Um, but but there there is so much out there. And the, the good news is that the official gatekeepers are no longer relevant. Unfortunately, that opens up the, the space for just some real nonsense. Um, you know, the, the, uh, what is it? Brandolini's law, the amount of energy necessary to refute. And then I edit just a little bit for the audience, male bovine fecal matter is an order of magnitude bigger than to produce it. And, and, and so much of what we end up doing, right. Is going back. No, it, you don't have to worry about colorectal cancer. No, it's not. You know, it, it, it's not going to make you fat. It's not going to make your heart blow up. You know, all of that stuff. But then there's all these other. So so now you can see that people. It, or at least this is my perception. You can see people saying, OK, so if you have diabetes, if you have type two diabetes, OK, I understand that you're carbohydrate intolerant, so it makes sense to not eat so much carb. But, but what about? I refer to those as the yeah, but questions. Yeah, but what about? Yeah, but what about? Yeah, but what about? And, and it, 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 it's just, it's whack-a-mole, if you're familiar with that carnival game. <laughs> you know, you, you have a hammer in your hand, and some little puppet jumps up out of one hole, and you hit it over the head to make it go down, and Another one pops up out of another one, and you just are supposed to keep, you know, whacking away at this thing. Um, I'd, I'd like to get us beyond that, um, but in the meantime, we get to deal with some of these issues. So you have people arguing that, you know, if we all went on plant-based diets, we'd save so many billion people or whatever the idiotic number is. Part of that justification is they're going to extrapolate from questionable data about heart disease rates and cancer rates and all that kind of stuff. We can deal with that. The other is they're going to cite equally ludicrous information about climate change and how many people it's going to kill. And they're going to make the leap to the fact or the 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 the, the assertion that it's animals that are driving that change or they're going to say that the earth can't feed current or future levels of humanity if we eat or as some would argue rely on animal products. And, and those are equally refutable. They're equally specious. Um, but how much time do you have <laughs> for yeah. us to dig into each one of those? Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be an interesting... I have a feeling this is going to be an, a long podcast now. But uh, so just to go back on to... Let's, let's open this can of worms and see, we'll see where, we, where it takes us. So first question here is... What is your definition of sustainable? What does that even mean? It gets thrown around everywhere. So what is sustainability or sustainable? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. Sustainable or sustainability is now a value. Um, and, and just as you say, it, it, and as I related earlier, um, you know, essentially the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee was getting caught out. We can't find actual nutrition science to support our position. So now we'll throw sustainable on it and that'll make it okay, right? That, that's the cloak of green. That's the cloak of 
we're now we're now virtuous. It's all good. Um, if sustain a, a, in my mind, if it's going to be a legitimate conversation, we have to consider more than just environmental aspects. And and in fact, I would rather we focus on the science of ecology rather than the belief system of environmentalism. In addition, we need to look at the societal aspects and we also have to look at uh, economic aspects. So, you know, ultimately, if farmers can't make a living producing food and selling it, it makes, you know, they, they won't continue. There's no sustainability without profit, right? That, mm -hmm. That's just the way that goes. Now, some people think that profit's a bad thing. Okay, fine. Now we've identified where we can have another conversation. But we need to identify the fact that you're coming from some other economic perspective than the one that's currently driving the world. Um, and then it, if we look at a societal aspect, I would like to say if we're currently spending close to a billion dollars a day in the U.S. alone on overt diabetes care, diabetes, prediabetes, how sustainable is that? And you and I have read and listened to the people that would suggest to me at least that that's a dramatic underestimate of the cost because we should now, I think, be looking at a whole host of chronic illnesses as being somewhere in this dysfunctional insulin dysregulation spectrum, right? If I'm understanding it properly, we are seeing some of these other damage from some other diseases related to hyperinsulinemia a decade before we would be diagnosing prediabetes and diabetes, right? So how big is that? And, and in my snarkier moments, when I really can't control myself, I feel compelled to point out that among the top four or five causes of death in the United States is medical error. Right. Yeah. And, and this, so, so, sorry, go yeah. ahead. No, no, go ahead. Sorry. So, so I would be much more interested in listening to physicians talk to me about how they think we should fix our broken food system after they've eliminated medical error as one of the leading causes of death in the United States. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so um, the sustainability has to consider all of those. And if somebody's saying to me that we have to eat a plant-based diet so that we can, they would suggest, avoid the impact of something 100 years from now, and I'm saying – well, today, 200 people are going to have some part of their body cut off due to diabetes in the United States. How do you weigh those? And, and understand that their projection is based on a tool that can't accurately forecast weather. What they're saying, you know, or it can't accurately forecast climate, right? And, and again, we're getting off a little bit here, but I, I, I want to be really hard in this conversation about what is sustainable and what isn't, because we haven't been up to this point, we being society in general. So we have this situation where chronic illness 
is bankrupting the United States, right? I, I don't think that's controversial. Yet at this time, we're having this conversation or argument or we're not having a conversation, however, you'd really like to look at it about health care. And the reality is that health and health care and health insurance are, in no, are not synonymous, yet we treat them as if they are. And, and I went looking for something that would kind of relate, it, you know, health, factors that influence health outcomes. And, and I found one model, and it's interesting when you look at how they laid it out, but basically um, they say health behaviors are 30%, clinical care is 20%, social and economic factors are 40%, physical environment is 10% of the contribution that leads to health factors that leads to health outcomes. And health outcomes would be length of life and quality of life. And so if you look at clinical care, that's access to care and the quality of care. That's 20% of what they're saying leads to health outcome. Tobacco use, diet and exercise, alcohol use, unsafe sex, that's what they say are in health behavior. Social and economic factors, the biggest chunk, that's education, that's employment, that's income, that's family and social support, that's community safety. I don't hear that being discussed in our health care debate. Right? So, so and, and I'm not that kind of doctor. I don't know, but that makes sense to me. It, it, you, 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 you know, if, if you didn't have those other things right, Right, you, you can't exercise your way out of a crappy diet, right? We we say that kind of stuff. But but what if you're, you know, like living in this it, you know, what if you don't have a high school education? What 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 if you're trying to make do on um you know hourly wage or less than full time you know, employment, what, you know, what if your family is, you know, a pack of wolves and, and, you know, so, so I, I want us to kind of take a step back and say, my, my goal is to see what we can all do to foster human flourishing in as many human beings lives worldwide as possible. And part of the challenge is that if our prime value is to minimize human impact, we're not going to be able to get to maximum human flourishing. The irony is if we get if if we focus on human flourishing, we will minimize human impact. Well, yeah. Yep. No, go ahead. No, I, I think it's time for me to take a breath and you to <laughs> ask a question. No, no, no. That was that was fantastic, and um, it, it it is very thought provoking because this seems to create a ripple effect, where you. Uh, it reminds me of when you throw that uh, stone into the water and it bounces above the uh, the the water. Uh, for a little bit, but at the same time, it's creating these ripples all over the stream. It seems like that's what how health and our, our food and nutrition and our lifestyle can. It, that's how it can impact the entire society. And uh, if you look at it from this perspective that you're mentioning, the picture is a lot deeper than what we think, especially in our culture, actually around the world, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, part of part of my training. So, so. Uh, I, I did a bit of work in soil fertility, okay, so if you will, plant nutrition. Now, if I want to do a study and look at um, aspects of plant nutrition, I can 
go find a piece of ground that's all the same soil type, you know, even topography, so no hills or dips or whatever. Uh, it's all been managed similarly for the past few years. I can then design a, you know, a, a, a experimental design, set out, you know, randomized, complete block or whatever is appropriate for what I'm trying to do. Um, and, and several replications, I can, I can put out the fertility treatments before or after the plants are planted and growing. Uh, I'll plant it all to the same variety, the same batch of seed. Uh, if I if I want to, I can even irrigate the thing, so I'm not dependent on rainfall. I, I can do all kinds of stuff to control for all kinds of variables. So when I get done, and I see a yield difference or whatever the parameter is I'm measuring, I can be, I can have a, a, a fair degree of confidence that what I'm looking at is in fact a treatment effect. Now I also can do nutrition work with animals. It gets more rigorous. There are uh, more, there, there are review processes because there are ethical considerations about what you can and can't do, and that's all proper. But it's, it's, it, you can, in fact, get genetically similar animals. Um, you can control them to varying degrees. You can feed them a diet that you can estimate to a fair certainty what the nutritional profile of that diet is. You can measure what they don't eat. You can measure what comes out. You can even put those animals in uh, calorimeters if, if you wanted to um, and get a a pretty good idea of what's going on. And as my friend Adele added at one point, she said, yes, and sacrifice them at the end of the study to determine body composition. You can't do those things with human beings, nor should you, right? No. Yet, human nutrition is, the, the people operating in that space too often want to behave and be perceived as being as rigorous as those other two disciplines. And it, it, it's not a bad thing that they can't be as rigorous. What is a bad thing is when they're going to, you know, act as if they are. Th that's where we, I think, I would suggest then have a, a problem. So now we get to the point where you were just saying with the, the ripples, well, none of those variables have been controlled for, right? So you have the healthy adherer effect that comes into these studies. You tell people who are more predisposed to listen to whatever they're being told to do something. Well, what else are they doing? What else is different about them than somebody who isn't? You know, are the people not listening also more likely to smoke? You say you're controlling for that, but I, so, so that's in play there. And I think we need to be aware of that going forward uh, in the conversation about sustainability. So I'm, I'm fully on board with the idea that the human diet ought to be, uh, here's, here's one more thing about cost. 84 cents out of every dollar in the United States, you know, healthcare dollar is going for chronic illnesses. And 99 cents out of every dollar in Medicare is for chronic illness. Wow. So, yeah, so, so if, if somebody's going to tell me, well, you know, this, this plant-based diet that I'm all advocating for is, is what people have to be on for sustainability reasons. I would push back and say, and if we can't sustain the cost of feeding it to our population, how do we account for that in the conversation? Um, so 
and and oh by the way we're on plant-based diets now part of that is out of necessity part of that is out of we're told that that's what we should be eating um so if if we if we look worldwide um, something like worldwide, 84% of the food calories are coming from plants. And worldwide, something like 64% of the protein is coming from plants. This is FAO UN information. And in, in what is it, 33 years now, 2050, um, we are projected to have a little more than 2 million more people. So 9 plus billion people, 2050. How are we going to feed them? Because that is a concern. We should be concerned about that. And we shouldn't, I would suggest, fall for the misanthropic approach of population control strategies that have been tried in the past. And that's a whole other conversation that we could have. Uh, part, part of what I suggest is that the earth is finite, if you will. You know, two-thirds of its surface is ocean. There are issues around, you know, fisheries management. I'm not qualified to talk about those. 14% of the earth's surface, if we look at the entire surface, is what's called rangeland. That's land that cannot, should not be in cultivation. Yet it can be producing a resource, high fiber food, feed stuff that can be converted via ruminant animals into high quality animal protein and animal fat, as well as other aspects of nutrition that are very desirable. Forest is about 10%. So now we're about a quarter of the land, the earth's surface, I'm sorry, not land, a quarter of the earth's surface could be in some form of ruminant animal agriculture. Only 4% of the earth's surface is in cultivation, or, and, and you could argue about the degree to which that's a good idea. 1% currently is urban industrial land. And as that expands, it's going to take away from that cultivated land area. So if we're going to feed this growing population, and, and there's some statistics or estimates from UN that say that by 2050, we're going to have to double food production to not just meet the needs, but because those populations are not just growing, they're, they're becoming more prosperous, which is a good thing. So today, I think, what did I see the other day? Something like three quarters of, um, oh, now I'm gripping on the number, so I better shut up. <laughs> um, no, I think, it's, I think it's something like three quarters of a billion people worldwide are still chronically undernourished, which people typically think of only on a caloric basis. And, you know, we might say, well, maybe obesity is a sign of malnourishment. But from their definition, they're probably just looking at protein and, and, um, and uh, calories. We've got a little over two billion people apparently being overweight and obese worldwide. Wow. So how, how are, if we're right and that animal products in the diet is the solution for this condition, where are they going to come from? Because the FAO, FAO only says that 60% increase in animal product production to meet those demands, but they're basing that on their implicit assumption of what's a healthy diet. So our understanding would probably say it needs to be far greater. So 
this is part of why I comfortably argue for a ruminant revolution. Point, you know, sort of hearkening back to the Green Revolution of the 60s and 70s, which allowed a billion people to not starve to death. But that was exactly what that was about, was, was avoiding starvation, and the ruminant revolution will be about fostering the, the, the um, thriving, the prosperity of this growing population, which itself will help us solve other problems, right? More brains help solve more problems. Um, and it won't be just in the U.S., it'll be worldwide. So there's some things that I've come across just to, again, because people argue, right? You know, well, if we were to take all the grain that we're feeding live animals to produce animal products, then we could feed humans. Well, no, we couldn't. <laughs> Because already two-thirds of the grain that's consumed worldwide is consumed by humans. Wow. So, so even if you took all the rest of that, that wouldn't be enough because it, the, the animals are increasing the human food supply. Now, I tend to focus only on the ruminants, not so much on the swine and the poultry. Because the, the ruminants have this ecological advantage, again, of being able to take a feedstuff that we can't utilize. Now, what many people don't recognize is that if, if you take, if you produce 100 pounds of a human utilizable food out of a grain, you tend to produce about 37 pounds of byproduct that humans can't use. Well, we can run that through animals or bury it in the landfill, right? You know, we've got to dispose of it somehow. It's not human food. How are we? So, so um, there, there's a whole lot in here that people don't know because, again, they're, they're not part of that very small minority who are involved in agriculture. But how do we foster the conversation that gets them aware of it? People will say that, well, we sh you know, rather than we should just feed the, the wheat to people directly, right? Well, in California, we can produce more human food, energy, and protein, which is also of higher quality, by per acre by growing alfalfa and feeding it to dairy cows than by growing wheat. Is, is that factored into the conversations about sustainability? I really don't think so. Um, and, and if you, you know, part of this, again, there are some people that get to act as if they're virtuous. You know, like big business, bad, we're good, right? Because we're organic, we're green, we're whatever, we're local, whatever. Well, you may have heard about a little purchase that happened here recently where one company paid $13.4 billion cash for another company. Right? So this, this, this fear of food, this, this mythology, this marketing has created this market that has hugely enriched some and arguably increased the, the stress on others. How do we factor that into the conversation? Um, I have one picture which I just think is the height of, of it's just so ludicrous to me. But what do – it's, it's cigarettes made with organic tobacco. Really? Yeah. <laughs> really? Or are we missing the point here? Um, so let's see. What else? Oh, oh, yeah. That's the other one. The organic Gatorade. 
Yeah. And you know what's funny is I, I went to the Winter Fancy Food Show in uh, last December or January. And the, there was the huge influx of natural and organic. And it said organic sugar. I was like, um, okay, no, no. <laughs> okay. It's, well, pre precisely. It, it qualifies, right? Um, whatever that definition is, it, it, you know, I'm not saying, although there has been just a recent, um, bit of a scandal where they realized that very large amounts of feed grains that were being brought in as organic from Turkey and some other former Soviet Union, um, uh, Republic, um, were not in fact organic, although they were brought in as organic and marketed into the organic agriculture channels. I'm not sure how important that is, but that's happening, right? That that's a real thing. But then what, what, what is, what is it people think they're buying when they buy that? What, 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 what's the implication to people? So, you know, I have the picture of the organic Pop-Tarts. <laughs> so, so b before we go further, a quick question right here. So just to make this a little bit more practical for certain people, we, when you go to the store, you see a lot of this, uh, especially in the meat aisle or in the eggs or any of those places, it's certified organic, certified grass-fed, all that jazz. It's kind of overwhelming for most people, even for myself. There's too many labels. How do we even figure out? How do we even get started here? What's even okay or good? Or is that just a marketing hype? Um, I, when, I'll tell you what I do. When I go to the market, um, if the beef is on sale, uh, we buy the you know, conventional beef. Um, we buy, uh, I guess... And I say we, so sometimes that's me and sometimes that's my wife. Um, Nancy found the local pork producer, and we've bought that in bulk. We have two freezers. Um, but if I want you know, bacon or something like that, I buy that from the store. I'm not concerned about the label claims, and we can talk about some of that. The best example that I could give you, and um, Ted Naiman is certainly somebody who should be on your list, um, but he related to me, and I think he's published this, so it's okay. He has a patient who's living in a tent. Now, I'd love to know the backstory, and as we were just earlier discussing, some of those aspects probably, you know, what's going on there. But, okay, he went to the secondhand store, bought a uh, cast iron skillet. He has a propane stove, uh, butane, butane stove, sorry. Um, he goes to Safeway, which is our local chain supermarket. He buys the 80-20 hamburger when it's on sale, you know, 80% lean, 20% fat. He buys the Safeway eggs when, you know, because they're the cheapest ones. That's what he cooks. That's what he eats. It costs him six or seven dollars a day. Food and fuel. And over the course of, and now I'm going to get this a little wrong, so I'll say a year, just to be on the safe side, he's dumped 70 pounds and normalized all his panels, right? It, 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 wow. the, the label claims are not the issue. You know, people are not diabetic. We don't have over half of the adult population in the United States diabetic or pre-diabetic because, well, let, let me put it another way. Dr. Atkins didn't get his results through grass-fed and organic. They didn't exist. Nor did doctors Michael and Mary Dan Eads in their practice that led to protein power. Those options didn't exist. Now, if somebody cares to and can afford to, that's great. But at the same time, if we're dealing with you know, populations 
that are not affluent, who are being challenged by all of their life circumstances, I think we ought to be very circumspect about some of these other claims about what the ideal diet ought to be. Because if you dig down into it, I don't find the data to support it. Yeah. Well, um, I think it's just, uh, you're, you're just blowing, blowing my mind up here. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it, 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 that's, that's the point. But yeah, I, I notice that all the time is there's a disdain in our society towards a lot of the, oh, it's cheap. Oh, it's from Walmart. It's that, uh, it's that, it's the whole thing about, I, I, I tell people in terms of how you get cars. Now, a Toyota Corolla is something that is feasible, practical, and everybody could buy it. You can always go higher and luxurious if you can afford it, but you still need a car to drive. So is that a good analogy over here? Well, it could be, yeah. Um, uh, sure, it's the marketplace, and, and people have lots of reasons for doing what they're doing. My concern in part is, as we have this conversation, so now imagine, um, so next week we'll, we'll both be, I'm looking forward to that, at the Low Carb USA conference. I say next week, I, from the date of we're recording this. Um, and then, so Monday after that, Sunday I speak, Monday I leave and travel to Kearney, Nebraska. And on Tuesday, I will be speaking there on what I call grass-based health and the ruminant revolution. Now, the people in agriculture look a lot like the rest of the population. The same issues are present there. If anything, their options are worse because they're removed from some of the centers, right? And so their access to health care is kind of problematic. But let's say somebody comes up to me after this and they say, wow, you know, you've, you've, you've suggested that, you know, I ought to be concerned about insulin levels instead of, you know, um, blood, gluco uh, blood um, cholesterol levels or whatever it is, you know, because I, I, I try to get people aware of the difference between perception and the research. Right. And, and so there's a series of questions that I throw in front of people just to try to get them to go. What the heck are you saying? Um, and then I say, you need to go and start looking into these things. And they do that. And then they find some people who, in addition to talking about how, you know, it's carbohydrate in the diet that raises serum triglycerides. Right. It's. It's saturated fat in the diet that increases your, your HDL cholesterol, right? It's, and and, and it's the, those sorts of things. Okay, but then at the same time, they start talking about some of these more agricultural-related topics that they don't, in fact, know about, the, they being the, 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 the diet people, for lack of a better phrase. Well, then my new acquaintance from agriculture goes, well, they're wrong about that. Why should I trust them on the diet side? That's the danger of us. And so then I could point to, you know, the, the, the books that talk about how commercial fertilizer burns organic matter out of the soil or how... You know, the, the animals in feedlots, they explode from bloat. Or any of these other things, which are just not true. Um, and, and again, it gets to, you know, we hear stuff and then we repeat it. And I'm guilty of it, so I'm, you know, kind of keeping it, you know, here, uh, keep the mirror up to make sure I... I avoid that as well. So this is part of why I think we need to have the two-way conversation between the groups and, and we need, and a conversation implies listening as well. So one of my wildest dreams is to get a group of people who are really familiar with uh, 
low carb, healthy fat, ketogenic, whatever you want to call it, nutrition approach and agriculture together in some place where we could kind of learn from each other and, and, and start this happening. Um, so that's, um, let me just, um, I'm looking, oh my, look at the time. Um, <laughs> here, here's some more things just to throw out there because I, this will maybe reinforce that, what was the name of that? Everything you knew is wrong. Uh, um, people will tell us that one reason to not eat animal products is because, you know, cattle are destroying the planet through greenhouse gas emissions. Well, if you actually go and find the data, the, you find even in the IPCC document that agriculture worldwide is less than a fifth of the greenhouse gas emissions. A little bit less than industry, a little bit less than forestry, a little bit more than transport. Now, if you look at the U.S. figures from the EPA itself, all of agriculture in the United States is 9%. 9%. Transport is 27%. Animal agriculture is only 7%. So people are confidently saying things that qualify in my book as male bovine fecal matter. <laughs> now, if, uh, what's the thing? If an honest man is shown to be an error, he either ceases to be an error or he ceases to be honest. Yeah. So people will sort themselves out here pretty quick. But if you just think about it, cows and sheep aren't alchemists, right? right? They don't create carbon. They're cycling carbon. They don't create nitrogen. Nitrogen is, you know, 78% of the atmosphere, but it's unusable to us. It has to be put into the system through any number of means, ultimately, from plants, I would suggest, through ruminants to us. Part of the problem here, and this is the game they're playing, they're only looking at emissions. They're not looking at, well, where did it come from? So they don't look at the, the feed coming into the animal to then come back out into the atmosphere, right? Because that's what it is. It's a cycling. But there's this whole interest now in what's called soil health. And without getting too geeky, um, the best thing you can do for soil health is have green growing plants covering the soil for as much of the year as possible. And the best way to do that is to have pasture and long-term pasture. So there's been some work done in Georgia just relatively recently what they saw is under well-managed, irrigated dairy pasture, they saw over uh, basically a, a, a three-tenths of a percent increase per year increase in soil carbon. Now, we didn't used to think that was possible. So to turn that into a number, that's 3.6 tons of carbon per acre per year that are now in the soil that didn't used to be. Now, at some point, that tops out, right? That won't keep going infinitely. But, okay, if you were to take that kind of an increase and extrapolate it, there's about 22 million acres of what we call degraded or low organic matter row crop ground in just the southeastern U.S. alone. You know, we've got a couple hundred years of agriculture prior to modern agriculture where we just degraded that resource. So what would happen if we just took 10% of that land and converted it into that same kind of 
management intensive irrigated dairy pasture system, just 10%. So now you're talking about 2 million some acres, right? Well, the numbers then come out and to just put it into, it, it's the equivalent annually of three and a half billion cars which would be three and a half times the number of ca cars that are in the world. It's the equivalent of 38 and a half billion barrels of oil. Well, the U.S. only consumes 7.2 billion in 2016, so that's over five times the annual consumption of oil. And that consumption figure includes biofuel. It would be the equivalent of three and a half times the number of coal-fired power plants that were in the U.S. in 2012. This is what makes me say this has never really been about animal emissions. It's been about being against animal agriculture. It's been about against consuming animal products. Otherwise, how do you explain this? Thank you for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed our podcast, you will really love our newsletter where we share exclusive news, research content we are working on, discussions from our community, and so much more. All of this is available when you sign up for our newsletter. Oh, and you also get a 10% discount on all of our online store items. Go to ketogeek.com slash sign up to access all of these goodies and join the low carb playground. Once again, it is ketogeek.com slash sign up. Till next time.